Hello everyone, welcome along uh, to tonight's Real Estate Investor webinar on how to find affordable capital growth properties. Uh, we're joined by a very special guest, uh, Terry Ryder from uh, Hot Spotting. Um, you can see him uh, uh, on your uh, little video screen there on the bottom right, but I'll, I'll introduce him uh, shortly. So uh, thank you very much for, for coming along the webinar. Uh, tonight's uh, scheduled to go for about 60 minutes and uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, drivers of capital growth and, and also go through a couple of areas that, uh, that have experienced um, some growth uh, due to some, some infrastructure uh, or investment from, from governments. So just hopefully this will give you a, a bit of an insight into the things that you can look out for to find the next um, area that, uh, that may experience some, some growth. Now, if you do have any questions at all during uh, the, the course of t the content, just feel free to uh, type in the, the little chat section there um, and your questions come through. We'll, we'll answer them as we go along, but uh, if uh, we sort of get too, too bogged down, we'll, we'll make sure we'll, we'll address it at the end when we do a bit of a, a Q&A session. All right, so before we kick off, just a, a quick disclaimer, um, just note that uh, uh, the content uh, uh, in, the, in the webinar is uh, provided as information only and it should be not taken as, as advice as such and we, we always recommend that you do your own due diligence and ensure that uh, you seek professional advice as well before making any decisions. So my name is Dennis Wong, welcome along and if you're new to the real estate investor community, um, I hope you uh, get a lot of out of uh, tonight's content. So I'm the product specialist here at Real Estate Investor and I've been investing myself now for a little over uh, 13 years and I've uh, been with the company for, for almost six. And uh, my very special guest, Terry Ryder, uh, the Managing Director of Hot Spotting. So uh, welcome along, Terry. Thank you so much for, for, for joining me tonight. Hello, Dennis. Uh, great to be here. Looking forward to discussing uh, Real estate, um, always my favourite topic to, to talk about. Yeah, and we thought it'd be a good opportunity to have you along, so I really appreciate uh, your time. And uh, look, for those that aren't familiar with Terry and, uh, and Hotspotting, I'll, we've got a couple of, uh, in a couple of slides time, we'll, I'll get Terry to introduce um, him and his, and his organisation. But uh, for those that perhaps have come through from, from Hotspotting um, and you, you're tuning into your very first webinar with us, just to give you a bit of context in terms of who we are and what we're all about, we're a, a software uh, platform that's been designed by property investors for property investors. And we've been around for a while now, since 2006. We are a publicly listed company here in Australia and it's all about helping property investors like yourself be more strategic and uh, data driven when it comes to property investment. Um, and you know, there's a lot of free data out in the market um, on the internet Given the um, you know the improvement of technology, a lot of the data that once was restricted to really real estate agents and property professionals or banks, um, it's now a lot more open, and you get a lot more of that for free. But um, look, there is a lot of data out there, so it's about you know un I guess uh, finding out what data that you should be relying on um, to help you make better decisions. And with real estate investor, it's about trying to be a one-stop shop to to give you enough to to make better decisions. So we don't do it all on our own. We do have, uh, we partner with industry leaders like CoreLogic, uh, PriceFinder, Domain, uh, Zero, Washington Brown, who, who specialize in depreciation reports to try and provide deep and a rich set of resources for, for property investors like yourselves. Now, um, Terry, I thought this would be a good opportunity just to um, introduce yourself. So, um, if uh, yeah, if you just want to give us um, a little bit of an insight in terms of um, who you are and, and what hot spotting is all about. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Um, I've been around um, residential property research and, and writing for um, over thirty years. Um, I started out as a, a newspaper journalist specialising in residential property. Uh, working for publications like the Courier Mail, uh, based in Brisbane, and, and later the Australian Financial Review, before uh, becoming a consultant to the industry. And uh, in 2006, I launched the hotspotting.com.au website, which was essentially set up to help property investors find uh, the best places to buy. Um, we specialise in seeking to identify the future growth areas, the future outer performers or hotspots. Uh, before prices grow, which is um, 
allowing investors to buy at the optimum time before prices rise um, in areas where confident prices will rise. So that's essentially what we do. Uh, we provide uh, a, a range of reports covering the whole nation, identifying um, the best places to buy in specific cities, specific states, also national reports. And we also have a range of um, what we call B2B products, um, products that we um, help uh, real estate businesses with real estate agencies, buyers agencies, marketing companies, developers, etc. By uh, very often it's um, writing um, custom built reports on specific locations, which is really what we specialize in. It's uh, gathering together all the information that's out there um, and putting it into a form that's easy to read and understand for a range of uh, real estate consumers. So that's um, in a nutshell what we do. Yeah, fantastic. And look, I had the um, uh, privilege of being exposed to, to some of these reports uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, look, for everyone tonight, um, uh, a little bit on towards the end of the, the webinar, we'll just go through just some of the bits um, of research that Terry does put together in these reports just to show you how in-depth they, they really are. So look, before we kick off into the content, I thought it'd be a good opportunity just to get an idea on the audience that we have um, tuning in. So I'm just going to launch uh, two two very quick polls, and look, it'll help Terry and myself perhaps tailor this slightly as well. So, you know, if we do have a lot of beginners out there, perhaps we, we might uh, take time to explain a few of the concepts a little bit more. But if we have uh, more experienced ones, then we can, we, we can skip skip um, those. So, um, I'll just go and go to the poll. So the first one question is, when are you planning to ne purchase your next property? So just give us an idea in terms of when you're ready. So, I've just launched that. If you just click on screen, um, you know, whether you're looking at buying right now, perhaps your finance ready, um, hoping to get uh, something before um, Christmas, or perhaps you uh, want to, are you looking more, more longer term, you're looking four to six months, or perhaps even towards a new, new financial year, um, July next year. Um, or maybe you're not looking at buying at all and you're just educating yourself and, and getting yourself as much data and information as possible before you, you, you pull the trigger. All right, so we're getting some people voting already. Fantastic. All right. So it looks like we've got a, a few, um, about 42% 40, uh, looking at buying right now. So I'm assuming you're, you're all market ready. Um, so hopefully this webinar will give you a bit of insight and perhaps maybe validate uh, some of the, the re your own research that you've done or perhaps that you're not sure where to look at. This may give you some ideas in, uh, in terms of direction. Uh, four to six months, about 21%. Six months plus 12%. Uh, those looking at more than a year, just a little bit over, just 20%, and only 9%, uh, about 8% just educating. Okay, fantastic. Appreciate your, your participation there. So I'm just going to launch one more poll, and uh, this is about how many properties do you currently own? So let's just come in here and I'll publish that. So I think, um, Terry, I think in some of the, a lot of the research, um, uh, most, well, the average investor in Australia owns one or maybe two investment properties. Yeah, the um, yeah, the official figures from the Australian Taxation Office show that 75% uh, of people with investment properties own one or two. Mm, uh, yep. So that's very much the majority. And those that own five or more are less than 1% of the total. Um, yeah which means that the vast majority of people out there are just, just own one or maybe two properties. Uh, it tends to put the light of some of the, the rhetoric we saw in the, the recent federal election where uh, the Labor Party was trying to ca characterise the typical property investor who's out there looking for their 20th or 30th property <laughs> and um, being propped up by negative gearing tax benefits. So it was very much uh, a million light years from the true situation, which is that uh, less than 1% own five or more properties. Yeah, and look, the, the numbers sort of suggest uh, from, just from the audience as well. So we've got, you know, 9% with zero properties. Um, so, uh, and then 39% have one. And then we've got 45% with two to four properties. So I may have probably should have uh, broken that up to, to two and then, and then three to five. And then we've only got 5% with five or more properties and zero with, with 10 plus. So it sort of yeah. does reflect the, uh, the, the stats that the ABS published. All right, yeah. excellent guys. All right, so just to look, I'll skip through probably a couple of these introductory given that, uh, you know, everyone, most people here have a property, but um, look, in terms of capital growth, you know, what is it? I guess for the person that's just starting out, you know, it's essentially it's, 
it's when there's an increase in the value of your property. You know, your your your, your property's increased in value from from the, the price that you you purchased it at. And essentially, there's two ways that a property can appreciate in value. One uh, is the I guess what most people do buy, hold, and forget. If you're looking long term, is just natural growth. You're just waiting for the market to increase, which can take a long time, and and there's definitely no guarantee that that will happen. Um, yeah. Some and some people might get lucky. Um, um, I guess if you buy at the right time of the market, which some people I guess did in Sydney a few years back, um, they would have seen some significant growth if they bought in the right area at the right time. Well, certainly, Dennis, um, our uh, contact with real estate consumers shows that um, increasingly property investors are looking for a little bit more than just passive investment, which is you know the natural growth that you're articulating there, buy and hold and wait for the market to increase. More and more investors we find are looking for ways to accelerate the process. So they're looking for property where you can perhaps value add and you can manufacture growth as you're suggesting through, yes, a building an additional dwelling or even a granny flat on the existing property or subdivide it, uh, creating yep. uh, two or three properties out of one property or doing yes. renovations. I think more and more investors are really looking for those opportunities. Yeah, we've we've seen that uh, that interest sort of um, uh, build up over over the last couple of years um, during my time here. You know, and you know what Terry alluded there is you know some people call it manufacturing the growth. You know, you're forcing that that that, that capital growth of that property or that site um, by doing things like renovations or, or subdividing and, and developing, and which we've seen a lot of, especially in Melbourne, where you know people are buying the you know three four bed house um, and, and knocking that down and putting two three townhouses on them. Which we're seeing a lot more and more of. Um, so it is a faster option to increase growth. You're not relying on the market, and um, you know you do have data. Um, well, depending on the area, you should be able to get data on to be able to see how likely or risky that strategy is going to be by looking at comparables. Um, so, and that's what what that's all about is is looking at things um, to support whether that strategy is going to work in that area. Um, now, one way of, of, of investing is, is buying in a blue chip suburb. So what are they? Well, essentially, they're, you know, they're, they're suburbs or areas that are well located, they're established, there's generally not a lot of free land available, um, and they're consistently going to return steady growth over time. Now, they still experience flat and, and downturns, so it's not always you know, every year they're going to be you know, 5%, 6% growth, but they generally do um, will always recover. Um, an example is, you know, inner city suburbs, and don't get me wrong, not all inner city suburbs are maybe blue chip. There's a lot of different other factors that that obviously um, will will contribute to capital growth. So, you know, it's not not just that one single factor being close to the city, um, but properties in these suburbs are generally going to be priced in the higher end of the market. So, not everyone's going to be able to afford to buy in areas like, you know, if we look at Brisbane in, in Hamilton, you know, considered quite a blue chip suburb. Um, it's you know uh, what five k's from the city, a CBD of Brisbane, and if you look at the graph on the right there in terms of house price, median house price, you can see that you know over time it's it's you know back in the early 2000s median house price is about 300,000, hit a peak in around 2008, um, you know bit of a sharp drop, but always recovers, and you can see now you know about one point you know, a little bit over 1.6 million in terms of median house price. So some capital growth drivers, Terry, I think, you know, I might get some of your input in here and, um, you know, I guess these are some of the things that investors should be looking out for. And again, it's not just about one single factor. Um, you know, you need to do thorough research on all of these different factors to help you predict, I guess, whether a property that you're going to be targeting or an area you'll be targeting is going to give you that capital growth over time. So obviously, number one being demand exceeding supply, uh, low days on market, which generally indicates that properties are selling quickly because, because there is a lot of buyers in the market. They're, they're putting in good offers and sellers are, are accepting. Low vacancy rates, obviously attractive to tenants because uh, uh, potentially that may mean high rental yields and there's, there's, there's not much stock available. Uh, low, to, low to no vendor discounting. I think we're sort of starting to see that um, in some areas now in Melbourne and Sydney where, um, you know, Vendors were having to discount to try and attract buyers, but if you can obviously see an area where it's generally not much vendor discounting, 
Um, there's, there's, there's generally indicates as good demand, high auction clearance rates, low supply of vacant land for development. Um, I think we've seen, Dennis, um, that first fact you mentioned, demand exceeds supply is very much a factor in both the Sydney and Melbourne markets at the moment. We've seen, obviously, an uptick in demand from buyers, uh, particularly since, well, there's been what I call a series of fortunate events which started with the federal election result in May, um, APRA yep. changes, interest rate cuts, tax cuts, yes. um, um, increased insistence for first home buyers, which has been now legislated federally. Um, but um, vendors have been surprising reluctant to come to the party, so we still have low supply, low levels of listings um, mm, relative yes. to what we would normally expect. So yes. Demand high, uh, supply low, also at a time when uh, construction of new dwellings, particularly apartments, has fallen away quite dramatically. So we, we certainly have that factor very much in play in the two big cities at the moment, high demand, low supply. Um, now, the factor that uh, you refer to, low vacancy rates, I think that's a very good leading indicator. Um, what the research tends to show is that um, quite often before markets have a price boom, they will have a period where vacancies are low and rentals have grown quite a lot, but prices haven't. And yep. then um, prices will subse subsequently follow that lead from the rental market. We saw that in Sydney prior to getting on its um, boom path around 2013. There were a couple of years of um, strong rental growth, but not much in the way of price growth. Yes. Um, Hobart's another example of that, where vacancies have been very low for a long time and still are, uh, about 0 0.5, 0.6%, yeah. according to the figures that we see. And that was very much a leader of the price growth that we've seen in Hobart in the last couple of years. Yeah, look, and one of the points that you touched on there is um, uh, um, the the construction. Um, I, yeah, I saw a lot, um, some numbers uh, that were published recently, and they were significantly lower than you know what in terms of apartment uh, approvals. I think were you know been the lowest that they've been for for a very long time. Um, so some of the other things that um, you know you should be looking out for is, is future development or infrastructure or amenities. You know, they're generally going to be, especially if they're going to be creating long term jobs and. You know, big picture photo here of the proposed $1.5 billion new Footscray Hospital, um, which is uh, going to be opening in a couple of years' time. That's just going to create more jobs and people are going to want to live around that area. Demographics, so really important looking at, um, you know, ABS stats, increase in population numbers, income levels. You know, is there a high percentage of owner occupiers? That's usually a driver of, of, of growth. Um, you know, they, they generally tend to buy based on emotion because they want to be there in an area for, for a particular reason and it's usually things because of schools and or employment. So you want to look at, and you can see there's a few points there when it comes to location, you know, if you're close proximity to CBD, not necessarily CBD though, but you know, I guess that's in there because it's that's a major employment hub generally, but we are starting to see more regional employment hubs pop up, public transport, schools, shopping centers, you know, cafes, entertainment, medical, you know, there, there are a lot of the key infrastructure and amenities that, that people want to be around. They don't want to be sitting in the in, in traffic for a very long time to get to those places. Yeah. Dennis, I think um, a couple of points that are worth um, elaborating on. We'll probably talk more about um, infrastructure as we go through the presentation, but I think it's absolutely yeah. pivotal. And I think um, what we believe to be true at Hot Spotting is that real estate markets are very locally based. They essentially arrive out of what, what is happening in local economies. It's not so much national factors such as the level of interest rates or you know, tax benefits like negative gearing or what's happening with the national economy. It's very much about the local economies, which what, which is explains why we have so many regional differences over the last several years while Sydney and Melbourne were having their boom. Um, Perth and Darwin were going backwards with their pricing and cities like Brisbane, Adelaide and, and Canberra were having only very minor growth um, and a whole range mm -hmm. of different scenarios playing out across regional Australia as well. And the, the explanation for those differences is that real estate markets very much arise out of what's happening in local economies. And we have very major differences from one state to the next, from one city to the next. Um, another point, on your list on the screen at the moment, employment hubs, I think that's a very important one. Proximity to employment zones is very important and it's important to understand that while the CBDs in our major city are major employment hubs, 
the vast majority of jobs in any city are actually outside the CBD. They're in a series of uh, suburban hubs, which might be, for example, around the major airport in our major cities. There's massive jobs nodes um, in the commercial industrial areas that spring up around major airports, yes. which is why the, Western, the new airport in Western Sydney is, is considered to be so pivotal property markets out in Western Sydney because it's going to create a massive employment zone. So it's yeah. definitely something to look for. The research shows that people, if they can, would like to live close to where they work. So buying close to major employment hubs, keeping in mind again that many of them are out in suburban areas, is, is a very important factor to keep in mind when you're selecting a place to buy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And and, and, and look, and, and this is the thing about trying to find untapped affordable growth areas. So, you know, by the time it hits the media, it's, it's probably too late. Um, you know, when you're hearing about hot spots and, 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 and people talking about, um, uh, you know, 20% growth and, and it's too late. And it's about trying to identify these right. areas of growth before it becomes too expensive. And we've got a couple yeah. of... Mainstream media is very unhelpful to property buyers of all sorts, Dennis. Um, essentially, um, they write a lot of stories about what's happened with median prices in, say, the last quarter or the last 12 months. And yep. that essentially is telling people where they should have bought perhaps a year ago or a couple of years ago, whereas what people are really looking for is indicators of where they should buy now before the growth has happened. Yes. Um, so that's where um, uh, research services like ours and like yours are so important to property investors because it provides the data that gives the clues to where the next growth areas are going to happen before they happen. And that's really valuable information to property investors and buyers of other sorts as well. Yeah. And look, some of those drivers there, guys, that we, that we listed before, you know, that's not a, you know, a full comprehensive list, but they definitely are the key to help you determine whether it's, it's likely going to, 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 to go through that type of growth. And, you know, that third point there, you know, capital growth follows rental yields. So Terry touched on that a couple of slides uh, prior. Now it's not always going to happen, but again, you know, if, if an area is, is is providing high rental yields for investors, if other investors are going to start to take notice that okay, well, you know, there's five six percent yields here that's quite affordable. They're going to then start wanting to buy in that area, and that's what potentially can drive price up there. But then you need to look at other factors as well that we talked about, like infrastructure and employment hubs, to see why why is it that that yields are high there. Um, and that it's not just based on one um, uh, thing, like if it's a mining town, for example, which is, which can be quite risky. Um, yeah, looking the at... Last point, sorry, Dennis, the last point you've got on the screen there, suburbs with major hospitals and universities, what we find is that in our major cities and also in regional cities as well, um, hospitals and universities often cluster together. There are often precinct in our major cities where there's... Um, not just the university, but there's maybe two, and there's also hospitals as well. So uh, Parkville, Carlton area just north of the CBD in Melbourne is a is a huge zone where there's two very large university campuses plus a couple of major hospitals. Uh, in Adelaide, um, down in the um, city of Marion, um, there's Flinders University campus as well as the Flinders, Flinders Medical Precinct. So there's mm. that clustering together, and when you've got that in a local market, it creates enormous demand for firstly for rentals, but also for people to buy real estate. Big, big job zones, and also lots of people going there as students, etc. Always workers, and therefore uh, demand for rentals in those areas tends to be well above average, and vacancies do tend to be very low. So it's it's a market to look for, I think, uh, that clustering of uh, medical and education facilities. Yeah, look, definitely agree. And look, these couple of next examples will you know sort of show or highlight some of this some of this data, and you know if you were looking. Um, you know, when these universe, uh, hospitals open. So, you know, this first example here is based on the Gold Coast in, in Southport. Um, so the original hospital was actually in Southport already, but it was m more towards the CBD. So if we look at the map there, um, uh, sort of the right-hand side there where the Southport private hospital is, the original um, Gold Coast hospital was, was, was there, but then they moved it uh, right in the middle there, um, surrounded by uh, residential suburbs like Parkwood, Labrador, uh, in Molendina. And like Terry said, there's a university directly opposite it. Uh, private hospital opened up as well. So it is a major, major hub. And so this university hospital opened up uh, in September 2013, cost of about $1.8 billion. 
So if we if we keep that in mind, 2013 is when it opened or when it completed and then opened shortly after. If we look at Southport, if we look at the, the median house price, look at 2013, starts to start, prices start to increase and it's been increasing. Um, obviously, it's flattened out a bit now and it's a bit of a correction, but a couple of years of growth there uh, since since that uni university, uh, that hospital opened. We look at the other suburbs, Labrador, you know, not much been happening, but then 2013, again, demand then starts to increase. And then over the last couple of years, has had some steady growth um, in terms of house prices. Uh, Parkwood, which is a bit of a, um, an older suburb, again, 2013, flat, nothing happening, but as soon as the uni opened, uh, the, the hospital opened, you can see that, that growth. And, you know, if you look at all the, the house prices, the median house prices before the hospital opened, they're around that 400, 450K mark. Now we're looking more up to six, 650K. And then if we go to Mullen Diner, which is a little bit further south, again, similar story, a little bit over 450K median house price. And uh, now we're looking at 600K a couple of years later. So we're looking at demographics. So, you know, with CoreLogic RP data, some of the reports you can pull, um, you know, takes the census data. We're looking at things like, you know, your owner occupier versus renters. So we'll just use Parkwood as an example, which is directly opposite the, the hospital, pretty pretty large area. Um, uh, you know, eight, a little bit over 8,000 in terms of populations, increased 3% over the last five years. And you can get a lot of that stats, incomes and stuff like that from, from these reports. If we go direct to the census, have a look at that. You know, between 2006 and 2011, the, the population numbers actually went backwards a little bit. But then 2016, so after uh, it opened in 2013, it, it, it's jumped up. Look at the median weekly household income, $1,200 back in 12, 2006 in terms of median weekly household income, um, and a couple of years ago up to $1,600. Median weekly rents, again, like Terry mentioned, the demand for rentals from students or you know young um, uh, graduates who, who are now just working at the hospital. There's demand for for wanting to 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 rent close, and the industry of employment. You know, 2006 2011 was more sort of hospitality. And then 2016, no surprise there, it's now uh, hospitals is the, the top industry of employment in the area. Yeah. Um, I might get you maybe talk a little bit about um, up Sunshine Coast, uh, Terry. So same, similar story, $1.8 billion and uh, a few years later, officially opened in April 2017. Um, yeah. We've got the Sunshine Coast Uni Hospital right in the middle there. Yeah. Um Different types of infrastructure have different impacts on uh, property markets um, and the ones we particularly like are the ones we're talking about, hospitals and universities. Mm. If you build um, transport infrastructure can be very influential but uh, it's a type of infrastructure where there's many thousands of jobs in actually building it but once it's finished there's not too many jobs in running it. Hospitals and universities are different. Lots of jobs in actually constructing the facilities, but when they're finished and actually operating, there's actually more jobs in operating them than constructing them. So they, mm. that type of infrastructure has a lasting impact on property markets because it creates a massive jobs node and it creates big demand for real estate in the vicinity. And one of the factors is that when you've got a major hospital, um, it brings in new people to work in that hospital. Sometimes there's thousands of jobs in a, a major new hospital facility, and many of them are highly paid medical uh, professionals, specialists. Yeah. And um, so people with those high incomes um, in particular can give a boost to median prices in an area. And one of the things we've seen on the Sunshine Coast is the top end of the Sunshine Coast market in particular has moved. So we have seen the the Noosa precinct suburbs uh, like Noosa, Noosaville, Sunshine Beach and Sunrise Beach um, have big increases in the last couple of years in their median prices, both for apartments and for houses. And we think that's um, directly related to, well, not just the hospital, lots of different things going on in the Sunshine Coast, massive infrastructure spend happening there. But that new hospital precinct is very influential and it's not just the university hospital that we're featuring in the slide on the screen 1.8 billion other things of a medical nature have sprung up around it so there's a new private hospital there as well uh, and it's still a work in progress um, ultimately this is a five billion dollar precinct so it's created a whole new industry for the sunshine coast which in the past has had an economy too heavily reliant on tourism which is a little bit fragile and fickle mm, yeah uh, now um, new things will be creating through a, a 20 billion dollar uh, infrastructure spend. Um, we're seeing the airport going international. We're seeing a new CBD 
created from the ground up in Marichi Door on 53 he hectares that's available. That's starting to happen now. And this um, medical precinct is um, still a work in pro progress. There's more stages to come and ultimately be a $5 billion um, industry um, based around the university hospital. So hugely influential for that economy and out of that the property market. So we're seeing big price rises at the top end. And I think it's part of a process that's going to make this market, this economy and its property market very, very strong moving forward from this point. Yeah, look, this is probably quite a unique um, one as well, because if you have a look, a lot of these suburbs here are, you know, a beach front suburbs as well. So, you know, yeah. for, 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 you know, doctors and medical practitioners that perhaps can afford to buy that in the higher end now, not only are close to work, but also close in terms of lifestyle to, to the beach. Um, and you, and Yep, you go that, that, Many of the suburbs, um, this is not like in the southern part of the Sunshine Coast, coastal strip south of Marichidora and Malulaba. And um, there are, there's a canal suburb called Minyama, which is uh, one of the top end suburbs, medium price, well above a million dollars there. And that's had some uplift. But many of the suburbs closest to this precinct are actually a lot more affordable, and particularly the apartment market. Not far, a little bit further south, we've got the Caloundra precinct, which has been very underrated but has been increasingly gentrified and um, you know has some wonderful beaches um, affordable real estate particularly apartments so it's a sort of market that even first home buyers um, can get into particularly the apartment market um, be close to um, this new medical precinct which has become one of one of the very big job nodes of the sunshine coast which um, overall is a, a regional city that's creating jobs and growing its economy at, at rates much faster than national averages, and I think that's going to continue. Yeah, and look, I just looked up some numbers there, uh, Terry. You're right. So uh, over the coming years, oh, well, at the moment, the hospital has uh, 450 beds, but uh, over the coming years, they've got the capacity to increase that to 738 beds by 2021. And then yeah. they've even got the ability to then um, expand that further to 900 beds. Um, beyond 2021. So obviously, you know, more beds means they're going to need to employ more people to be able to service more patients. And in addition to that, you've got the private hospital that's also there and also there's specialist medical clinics that have also um, been built because, you know, they want to be close to the university hospital. And the, the name Sunshine Coast University Hospital is important too because the Sunshine Coast has a, has a very important and, and forever growing university, the Sunshine Coast University is um, is another growth industry for the Sunshine Coast, and it's um, not too far away from the location of this uh, uh, hospital complete in 2017. So again, you've got that um, that interlinking of medical and health facilities that we see in other cities around Australia, and it's very much evident here on the Sunshine Coast, and that's um, becoming an important part of the the growing and diversification of this economy, which I think is really important uh, because um, previously, as I said pre before, too reliant on tourism, which is quite kind of a, a, a fickle industry. It's very prone to you know, bad weather or people not being confident about their jobs. Uh, but now that you have um, these additional elements to the, the city's economy, it's becoming much stronger. And I think it's just going to go forward from there, helped by other factors like the, the creation of the new CBD, the uh, upgrade of the airport to international status, the new international subsea cable, which will give the Sunshine Coast the fastest internet links to Asia from anywhere on the eastern coast yeah, of, that, of Australia. Yeah, yeah. That, got, that, that got announced last year, didn't it? Or early this year? Yeah, I mean, there's so many things happening. Um, this economy, I wrote a, a major report recently in which I came to the conclusion that I think that the Sunshine Coast economy, this, the story there is the most compelling economic story anywhere in Australia, and um, out of that is coming a, a very, very strong property market. So one that's uh, well worthy of uh, consideration, I think, by property investors around Australia. Yeah, so look, similar to, to the Southport uh, story, if we have a look at those four suburbs that I've highlighted there, they're quite close proximity to the, the University Hospital. If we look at Warana, look at the, you know, again, 2017, once it opened, there was a bit of a dip, but then median house prices increased, and you can see the, the green bars there is the number of sales, so the, number of sales, the list, number of listings is, is reduced, but 
prices are still increasing. Ocarina, again, 2013, price jumps, and we look, you know, the median house price was about 650. Um, now we're looking closer to the 900K mark. Uh, Wertala, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, again, similar Wertala, story. Yeah. Wertala, yep, similar story. Five, you know, 500, 550, you know, affordable um, sort of area. Now it's coming close to the 700K mark. Karamundi, again, mid 500s, bit of a dip there. But they all seem to have a sim the similar similar growth lines post post the opening of the of the hospital. Yeah. So where do you go look for you know where do you look for these projects you know where do we look for these you know where where, where this spending is is going to happen from government. So every state and even at a national level they've got their own website. So here's an example of the, of the Queensland project site that you can go to. Um, and you know and again uh, just recently um, it's been announced that stage three A of the Gold Coast tram line is going to be um, uh, built. They're going to uh, start, I think, digging uh, or start construction early in the new year. So again, what's you know, it's going to open up access from Broadbridge to Burley Heads. Burley Heads is a major tourist spot as well as well as a great spot for locals to hang out. But what about all those little areas in between, Miami? Um, you know, are they going to start to to take off even you know even more than than um, you know than before? Uh, here's one for Victoria. Uh, Victoria's big build. You know, you can you can access this. All this information is for free. Um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the work that that Terry does, which which consolidates all this information in one nice little um, report. But again, you can jump on there and have a look. And, and every state will, will have its own um, own site. So what, I guess okay, what do you do about that? So once you find a potential area where there is infrastructure going in and it, you know there's this commitment from the government there's funding it's, it's started you know how do you find these 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 deals or how do you find opportunities and this is where the real estate investor platform can can can, can help where you've got the ability to, to narrow it down by a strategy so you know if you're not just relying on natural growth and you want to renovate or you want to see if there's a, an opportunity to develop or subdivide then you can find these 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 listings quite quickly using um, the investor platform because we actually look at 20 property portals, and we bring all those listings into um, our system, and we can look at keywords where you can quickly identify those opportunities. So there's two ways you can go about it. So option one is if you know if you're one of those investors that are in the five plus group, and you know you've got a much bigger borrowing capacity, then you know we do actually have a keyword strategy called capital growth, but it is looking for those blue chip types of suburbs because we're looking at keywords like city views. You know, waterfront, water views. You know, they're going to always grow over 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 time. But if you're just starting out and you want to, you know, look for an affordable um, uh, suburb where it's but there is the potential for for capital growth, then this is where option two can help. Where you can actually do a radius search. And I've got an example here of another, again, a university that we've been talking. You know, University of the Sunshine Coast, but uh, it's not actually based on the Sunshine Coast. Um, it's actually based out of the Moreton Bay region and um, out of a suburb called called Peachtree. They've already started works on it. I think it's due to open next year, isn't it, Terry? Um, well, the first stage anyway. Yeah, they, they, they're aiming to have it ready for the the start of the university year next year. It's very much under construction. I think it's a game changer for that area. It's, it's already a good solid area and it's sort of a place that attracts good demand because it's affordable. You've got... Yeah. Uh, uh, Petrie and Launton, two neighbouring suburbs, which which have what I like to call good real estate bones. They've got all the basic things that people look for: affordable real estate, lots yep. of schools. They're on the train line connecting to central Brisbane or going north to the Sunshine Coast. Um, great retail offering. There are lots of um, sort of major shopping centres and and other forms of retail. Some also lots of green space there. Um, so it's, it's quite a good lifestyle area for people on a budget. Um, but this coming in the midst of, of those suburbs where median house prices are a sort of low to mid uh, 400,000s, I think, um, mm. this new university campus is going to have the impact we've seen happen in some of the other places we've talked about. It's just going to create a huge jobs node. So a lot of people are going to be working there. And uh, as we know, people like to live as close as they can to where they work. But also, of course, the student factor, people studying there are going to want to be uh, renting accommodation as close as they can um, to that facility. So it's going to be a massive factor in a market that already ticks a lot of boxes, I think, partic particularly just basic 
um, amenities and infrastructure that already exist and affordability. Yeah, I think it's not too far away from uh, the North Lakes area where there's the massive Westfield uh, that shopping centre that opened there, with Costco's out there, Ikea's out there. I mean, that, that yeah. um, opened up a couple of years ago, I think, and it, it did wonders for yeah. that area. Yeah, that's right. Well, North Lakes has introduced a lot of infrastructure into the area. So, you know, you've got you know big shopping centre, but also the bulky good stuff. The Ikea Superstore, there's not very many of those in Australia, but this location um, has one nearby. Um, mm. you know, libraries, all those sort of basic community facilities that are important to people. So that's nearby. But the suburbs of Launton and Petrie themselves also have very good infrastructure, particularly retail, schools, yep. um, and um, and the train, the commuter train station, that's an important factor as well. So, if, you know, you own real estate that's uh, within um, easy striking distance of, of all of that, then you've got a lot of drivers that are going to uh, push the mine and therefore um, capital growth over time. Yeah, and if we ever look at the Petrie median house price at the moment, you know, 450k. So very, very affordable. Um, I'm, you know, I think some of the blocks are uh, a lot larger than your inner city Brisbane blocks. You know, we're probably talking more about 600, 700 square metres compared to your, you know, 405 square metre blocks. Um, and then I'm guessing it's probably a matter of time before councils then perhaps start looking at zoning and seeing whether you can um, increase uh, density in some of the some of the pockets of these suburbs. So you know, 450k at the moment. Uh, obviously, uni's not open yet, so there's no need for for people to start looking and moving in there. But you know, we're not very far off 2020 now. So um, I think uh, yeah. over the next 10 years, the uni can be able to accommodate up to 10,000 students. Yeah. And there was some media just in the last couple of weeks, Dennis, about that facility, and it it, it sounds like, um, according to the political rhetoric, in, at least, that it's going to be an, an even bigger and more important facility than originally proposed. Uh, mm. uh, the, the sort of rhetoric around turning into a kind of a, a Silicon Valley type centre uh, um, yeah. it remains, to be, remains to be seen how that will evolve. But certainly, it's going to be a very, very important part of the, the economic fabric of that location that's going to have a big impact on real estate in the immediate vicinity. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so, you know, knowing that that's happening at the moment, you know, you can start potentially, you know, if all those other variables, if all those other factors make sense and, you know, um, you can identify a site by doing a radius search around Petrie. You know, we can do a 10 kilometre uh, search around 4502 being the, the postcode of Petrie. You can also then add things like suburb rental yield. So perhaps look at some of those neighbouring suburbs. Are they high rental yields at the moment? Look at vacancy rates. You know, try and narrow down um, your, your search to, to areas that are already quite, quite, quite tightly held. You know, once a listing pops up, so here's one in Strathpine. You know, asking price three nineteen. You know, very affordable, six hundred and seventy three square metre block. Like I said, so much bigger than you know the, the average Brisbane block. Um, you get a lot of stats around. So this is now where all this data comes in to help you establish, okay, what's this property really worth right now? Is there the potential to, to renovate if that's the strategy? You know, we've got median listing prices. You can see the median weekly rent for a three-bed house in this suburb. The graph will, will give you some indication of what, what's happening in growth for three-bed houses over the last couple of years. And you can see in this particular case, it's a renovate and profit. So that's the, the, the keywords used by the listing agent. Um, and then you've got your suburb stats on Strathpine as, as a whole. So we can see 1.8% vacancy rate, average days on market 78, 95 current listings. And then you can also quickly see zoning, land use, and, and any overlays. In this case, it's, it's not available. But overlays will usually refer to things like if it's uh, there's a character overlay or heritage overlay, flooding, bushfire, things like that. But you know the zoning here, general residential, next generation neighbourhood. So to me, that sounds like there may be some rejuvenation that might be occurring. Uh, that maybe there's a big a big plan in place from local council to 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 uh, change that area up. So you can get all those stats just from the from the listing to help you make um, a decision on whether it's worth worth pursuing further. So if we look at some of the neighbouring suburbs again. You know, here we go, Strathpine. So this is the property that we you know that that came up as a result. Um, you know, we've got median price of uh, uh, just under 450. And we can sort of see, you know, there's been sort of steady, slow growth, nothing sort of, you know, um, no steep increases or drops. But once the university opens, you know, is that going to change? Uh, Launton, one of the suburbs that uh, Terry just mentioned, again, low 400s, median house price. 
uh, Kalanga, uh, 400. Um, so I'm just going to run a just a quick stretch to show you that live. You know, what does that look like? You know, how do you how do you how do you sort of narrow it down further? So let me just switch across. So you know, instead of going on domain or realestate.com and manually going through you know each listing one by one and spending hours and hours of research time, you can actually just speed up the process by looking at keywords using you know look, filtering by vacancy rates. You know, it's 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 not about the pretty pictures and uh, trying to uh, uh, sell the house because it's got um, uh, the media room or the outdoor deck. It's about looking at the numbers. So, all right. So we've had a lot of members. You know, they've come back and said that you know they've they've reduced their, their time by half when it comes to searching. And then you know, once you find your shortlist your properties, that's when you can then spend more of your time actually doing the research, going on, jumping onto your, your RP data and having a quick look to see, okay, how long has it been on the market? You know, can you, uh, what are the average days on market? Is it three bed more, more popular with four bed or than four bed houses? Having a look at those numbers. So then we'll look, so we'll go, let's do 15 kilometers and uh, we'll do that radius of four, five, oh two. So I'll go out a little bit more. So keyword strategy, this is where you can, you can um, uh, specify what it is that you're focusing on. What's relevant to you? So if you've got, if you're a more experienced investor and you're just looking for something that's going to give you capital growth over a long time because you don't want to do a renovation or go through subdivisions and talk to council, then you know set it on capital growth. Try and find a property that has a waterfront. Um, otherwise, if you're looking for something to renovate, you can pick that as a strategy. And then the keywords are going to we automatically hard code things like renovators delight, uh, cosmetic, add value. You can then combine that with other filters. So if I expand it all up, there's not actually a lot of filters that you need to have to worry about. It's just about understanding which filters are going to be relevant for what strategy. So let's just say we don't want to touch anything that's in a, um, an apartment complex or a townhouse complex. We're doing houses. Now we're renovating, so we want to find something at least, at least something priced below the median of that area. So we can say set it to maximum 80%. So if the median, I'll just use some nice round figures, if the median listing price for a four bed house is $100,000, at 80%, it means my search results will only show me any properties listed at $80,000 or less. So you've got that $20,000 price gap. I'll combine that with vacancy rate. So let's set it, say, nothing more than 1.5%. And I think most uh, most property professionals say if you can find anything between two and three, that's usually uh, quite a, um, uh, a balanced market. Anything lower, the better. So you can see, based off, you know, I've used a few filters here. I've got seven matching properties. You know, this one here is from Domain. There's no address. They're just listed as Eaton Hills, the suburb. Uh, Bray Park, you know, asking 289, you know, very, very affordable. 607 square meter block, 70.5% of the median listing price. Because at the moment, three bed houses, 410 is the median listing price. And we've got a median weekly rent of 375, 4.8% gross yield. So then you can open up the ad. So again, more data. Okay, there's the, the keyword renovations popped up. We do provide you links to the local council website, infrastructure, so you can go straight there and do some of that research if you're not familiar with it. Vacancy rate, days on market. You've got your zoning here, overlays, land use potential. So in this case here, it's saying you might be able to put a duplex or might be able to put some townhouses on there. Always got to double check with council. And then you get an idea on the breakup of that population of the area too. So we can see that, you know, 47% are looking at buying, 25% are fully owned, and you've got a 28% rental market. And you can quickly see, you know, if you're developing or if you're renovating and then looking to sell, you can see the competition, what else is on the market. And you can see it by price range, by property type, and also look at rentals as well. So it just puts everything in the one spot so you can find them quickly and then hop on over to do your, your, your due diligence in RP data um, to, to look at the, the actual numbers and see if it's, okay, is it is it fairly priced? All right, so let me switch back. So it's all about for, you know, the tools are built for, for you know, investors that are doing it themselves. Now, obviously, you know, you, you saw a few of those links where you can go to council website, infrastructure website, you know, you do a lot of that research. What's, you know, what's the government planning next? You know, there are a few different websites that you have to go to, but, I guess this is where hot spotting reports that Terry Ryder um, produce comes in. Um, and Terry, I might maybe just get you to talk a little bit about um, this is just an old, some snippets from some of your, an old report that you released last year. But do you want to perhaps yeah. just talk about, I guess, yeah, what, you're, what you've included and, you know, how long actually, you know, the time it takes you to, to I guess, put all this together? 
Yeah, well, we have a, a daily research exercise where uh, certain staff members are scaring various sources, including media online, um, look, looking for indicators. The thing we look for specific things um, to identify areas um, to put them on our radar screen as potential hotspots that we might include in a report like this. I think the one the uh, the cover we had in the previous slides was our, our national yep. uh, top ten best buys report. Um, so the, the locations that are included in that report, um, which we update um, three times a year, um, are, are those the, the places that we think are the, the best 10 locations for people. We do emphasize um, areas that are affordable to most people. So um, we think it's not much point in advocating areas like um, like the Turax and the Wallaras of this world where the vast majority of people can't afford to buy. Um, but, um, you know, Bendigo is on screen. That's, that's a great example of a market that offers a lot to the vast majority of investors because it's very affordable. You can buy good property in the 300,000s there. The uh, vacancy rates uh, are very low. The rental market is strong. You can get good rental returns there. And there's also lots of potential in that market to find property that um, has value added potential uh, in certain zonings and certain areas. You can buy property on large blocks. A thousand square meters or more, which can be subdivided, subdivided into two or three blocks. Um, so we we tend to emphasise uh, in these reports the underlying economy because we think that's really important. So we talk about uh, the the makeup of the economy. Economy. We like locations that have economic diversity. Uh, we talk about um, demographic and population factors. Then we talk about the property market. And I think perhaps the most important segment of these uh, location reports that make up a report like Top 10 Best Buys is the, the future prospects, that segment. And that includes the table of upcoming developments that you're showing on the screen now. So we, we have all the major projects that are likely to create jobs in the area, that are likely to create economic activity and increase the amenity. So what's on screen, different types of infrastructure, education, infrastructure, transport infrastructure, very important commercial developments, residential developments. They all play a part. And we have a location like Bendigo where there's a lot of this activity going on. It gives you um, confidence in the future of that city, which, um, for example, um, recently completed as a $700 million hospital facility uh, for Bendigo. The fact that the state government would spend that level of investment in uh, Bendigo is an indication of how important they see it and the future of the state of Victoria. And it certainly is a very important regional city. It's um, well connected to the capital city. It's got a strong economy in its own right. And uh, for investors, very affordable, good rental yields, low vacancies. So it's one to consider. So all of those factors are included in a typical location report. And a top 10 report uh, comprises 10 location reports. We, we choose the 10 locations and we include our standard location reports for each of those, roughly in order of the priority as we see them. We rank them from 1 to 10, um, although, you know, um, it would differ from one investor to the next depending on their price range, what they already own, what their strategy is. But we do uh, list those 10 locations in order of... Um, ranking as we see them. Bear in mind that this is a report from last year yep. um, showing uh, some of the key projects that were uh, on the books, uh, whether proposed under construction or recently completed in that market. And um, what we quite often do is we uh, get out a calculator and add up um, the total of all these uh, various projects, infrastructure projects, property developments, and sometimes um, in the case of the Sunshine Coast, for example, you get uh, a figure that's over $20 billion, which is massive for a, a regional city of that size. For Townsville is another example where it's even more than that. Um, and that's when you start to think that here, here's a market that's going to go places in the uh, short to medium term because there's just so much investment going into inf infrastructure or property developments that it's just got to be a generator of a strong economy and yep. therefore demand for real estate. Fantastic. All right. Thanks for the feedback, guys. So, look, the, the session has been recorded, so we'll, uh, you'll actually get emailed the copy. Um, so, hopefully, uh, you'll be able to um, yeah, re-watch re those bits if you didn't miss any.
So, um, yes, yeah, so there is a special offer you're running at the moment, isn't there, Terry, in terms of some of your reports? So I guess for those that um, don't want to spend the time or don't have the time to uh, actually go to all these different sites to try and find out what is actually happening there, you can, you've you actually done all the hard work and um, you've got a, an offer on at the moment? No, that's very much what it's about, Dennis. Um, you know, pe people are time poor, uh, typically, and um, we try to make it easy for them because there's so much information out there. All the information a property investor could ever want is out there, um, but it takes a lot of time to access it. And then yep. uh, if you don't have experience, you can't necessarily make sense of it. So our reports bring it all together and put it in a readable form that makes sense of it and takes the legwork out of it for property investors. Now, what we um, know to be true, and I'm sure everybody um, has observed it um, in um, you know, real estate research over the last say, six months has been a, quite a big change in the, the overall climate nationally for real estate. The first half of the year, there was a lot of yep. negativity. But since um, the federal election result, there's been a series of events which have um, increased confidence. And we've got to the point now where we're seeing some strong uprise, some strong uplift in major markets. Sydney, Melbourne, it's starting to spread to other major cities. And there are also regional centres that are also got very strong uh, demand in their markets with prices rising. So we thought it was an opportune time to have a, a bundle, a special offer that um, combines our, our three most popular reports into one bundle. So we've got our national top 10 best buyers reports, our top 10 regional hotspots reports, which we think is very important because um, regional hotspots provide what we call a win-win win situation for people, very affordable prices relative to the capital cities, much better rental yields usually. And if you buy in the right places, really good prospects for capital growth. So I think um, I think more people should be thinking regionally in, in their search for um, future growth markets to buy. In. And the Price Predict Index, which is another of our very popular reports, which we publish um, every quarter um, as a leading indicator uh, looking at sales volumes and particularly where prices are going to grow. So we've, we've bundled them all up into a bundle where if you bought them and individually, you'd pay $561, but if you buy the three as a bundle, it costs two ninety seven. So, yes, uh, saving almost 50% if you grab that bundle. And if you grab and have a look at it, you're going to get some really good leads onto where to buy in the current climate where we've got very cheap finance, easier finance, markets mm -hmm. rising, confidence rising, very good time to be considering uh, getting into the market as investors, and I think your poll at the beginning, Dennis, indicated that uh, the the biggest quartile or the biggest uh, section of your poll were people are wanting to buy now, and I understand yeah. that because it really is an opportunity um, with very cheap finance and, and markets coming out of a slump and starting to rise. It's opportune, and that's why we timed this particular bundle for now to try and help people make some choices. Yeah, look, and, and, and some of the economists are saying that, you know, if um, I guess spending over the Christmas New Year period is not going to be uh, strong, that um, first month, well, first month of the, uh, when the RBA meet, that the uh, interest rates are probably going to drop uh, again. So um, it is definitely a, a good time in terms of cheap finance. Um, yeah. And um, so the, I've, I put the link up on there, so you can see down there. Otherwise, I've, I've, I've launched the um, the deal as well onto uh, the on the right hand side of your screens there, guys. You can click yeah. order now; it'll take you just to that link. You can have a look anyway. Um, and if you yeah. want to take up that offer, you can you can do that at any time. So, is there a um, uh, a time when that's going to expire, uh, Terry? Um, that that bundle is. Um going to be um, active and, until about Christmas. Um, okay. You can also just go to hotspotting.com, the website, the homepage, it's a, a major presentation of that special offer. Um, there was a time, uh, I don't know what you find with your business, Dennis, but we used to uh, or at least assume that um, the Christmas holiday period is probably not a great time to be marketing our products because people are doing other things. But in actual fact, we found quite the opposite. It's actually a very active time for um, the hotspotting website in terms of sales of our reports. I think it's because people, are, a lot of people are at leisure and uh, they're quite often holidaying in sexy places like the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast or <laughs> yep. Byron Bay perhaps, and they like to tie kick real estate and have a look and, and um, that's, that's when they um, have some time to think about and maybe get online and do a bit of research um, on our website or on yours. Um, and so it's a very active time, we find, um, 
for people, um, particularly as it's the end of the year, they're coming into a new year, so they're probably thinking about what they're going to do with investment-wise in 2020, and it's a, it's a good time for us to have um, uh, these kinds of offers active for people making plans for the new year. Yeah, look, I've had a few clients last year as well mention that um, you know they were jumping on our on our program because they'd actually find Christmas is a better time because there's less buyers, well, less competition, and they they're, they're able yeah. to get property is probably a little bit cheaper than 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 if there was a lot more people looking. So, um, I mean, look, I bought my first property um, over the Christmas period, and I was lucky yeah. enough to get a pretty big discount because there was no other buyer really interested. So, um, yeah, Christmas is still a good time to have a look around. I know a lot of lawyers and real estate agents shut down, but, um, you know, most real estate agents these days, they're, you know, they're, they're available any time. Their mobiles are published readily uh, yeah. on all their websites and all their listings. So I'm sure they'll... They'll take your call if yeah. you're interested in a in, in a property. So, Partic sorry, um, particularly in those areas where people are likely to be holidaying, a lot a lot of them are, are locations that also have potential to be, um, you know, current or, or future hotspots. You know, we talked about the Sunshine Coast as one example, and we talked about um, new infrastructure coming into the Gold Coast. Uh, many other locations that. Um, have uh, growth potential that might be places where people are holiday. But I also think that um, this um, holiday period in particular um, could be very strong because uh, there's a world of difference between the climate we're in right now and where we were 12 months ago. 12 months ago, um, negativity and, and pessimism reigned. Uh, federal election put a dampener on activity and decision making. And now we're beyond all that. We've had three interest rate cuts. Um, APRA changes, all sorts of things that are positive for real estate. So I just think that um, this Christmas, New Year season, we're going to see property investors um, taking the time when they're at, um, not at work perhaps to be a lot more active than they would have been uh, 12 months ago. Yeah, for sure. So look, in saying that as well, we, we, real estate investor, we're, we're also doing a, a last offer as well for the year. So if you are you know, uh, looking at taking advantage of those reports and then getting an idea of, of some of the, the, the areas that are likely to, to experience growth, then you can utilize, potentially utilize our tools to, to then try and find uh, properties that are currently on the market to, to help you um, uh, secure that. So as part of Real Estate Investor, you do get access to a few different tools as well as search, but you do also get access to CoreLogic RP data, which is what a lot of the property professionals use and real estate agents use to generate reports. And you, you know, essentially, you're going to get an advantage over a lot of other investors out there in the market. There's on-demand on support and help as well to make sure you, you you can utilize the tools. So, you know, for us, from a support point of view, we're open over the um, up right up until Christmas on the 24th, and then we come back right on uh, the 2nd of, of January. So, we're only closed for a week. Um, so, there is a lot of there's still support available. Um, you get access to um, uh, video tutorials, an online support center, access to previous webinars as well. And we've got a lot of videos that are actually based by strategy. So if you are looking at renovations or, or, or subdivisions or developments, you can actually watch videos in those in that context um, to, to see how you can utilize those tools effectively. So a bit of training, like I said, we, we partner with CoreLogic. They, they run training sessions as well for us. So. Um, these are our retail rates, so if you're looking at a month-to-month -month membership, $149 includes access to RP data. If you're more of a, um, looking at a couple of deals a year, you've got one-year or two-year options. Um, and you get access to, like I said, real estate investors tools as well as RP data. So this does now bring us to the Q&A session. All right, Terry, we've got a few questions, Terry. So um, I'll just go back to, to the start and see if we can uh, answer a few of these. Um, so Fora has just mentioned that uh, my property has gone down in price due to the oversupply of apartments in Brisbane. My interest only five year period um, load is up. What should I do? So uh, for look, it's a bit hard to, oh, look, I might uh, perhaps just start off there, Terry. Look, it's probably a bit hard for, or for us to answer because we don't know your personal circumstances. Yeah. Um, that's, that's always the, the underlying factor, isn't it? Uh, the answer, it, um, three people in the same situation or with the same property uh, could have three different answers depending on their uh, individual circumstances. But um, I think one factor that would be common to all is that um, 
the reason why values um, may have fallen in the Brisbane inner city apartment market is because there has been oversupply and vacancies have been very high, but that gradually has been absorbed. So we're now getting very close to the point where uh, vacancies are, are down to acceptable levels. Um, still a little bit to go in some of the suburbs in the near city area, but by and large, um, the inner city apartment market vacancies have now got down to levels where we could start to see some growth again. Um, and Brisbane generally, certainly vacancies were um, well above 3% in recent years, but now they're down to about 2.5%, and it's trending in the right direction. So if uh, someone has sort of toughed it out for the last five years um, and they've managed to hold on this long, it might be worth holding on a bit longer because um, when you're likely to be coming into a period where you might actually see some growth again. It would be a shame to have lasted five years of downturn and then sell just when things are starting to turn up again. That would be a general comment I would make about that. Yeah, look, I could probably add a little bit to that too because I've, I've got an apartment in the city of Brisbane as well. So well, I'm not in the so well, not in the city, but um, about four k's out. Um, similar story, uh, um, you know, the value of mine went down a, a couple of years ago, and you know, I did a renovation, and I was still only able to get the same rent that I did prop. Uh, prior to the renovation, just because there was so much supply available. But um, this year, I've started to see that turn and I've been able to put the price up and there has been a bit more demand uh, for that apartment. So, But the location is going to be key. So, I mean, I guess with my apartment, it's, it's not brand new. It's actually walking distance to the ferry, to the train, to buses. It's close to the private hospital as, and it's it's quite it's right in between the University of Queensland as well as the city. So I've got a lot of things going for it. Um, so I've decided to, you know, I'm not going to sell it just because of the location. And I, you know, like like Terry mentioned, the that oversupply issue is is, is, is it's, it's turning. So um, yeah, there's a lot of factors for it. We don't, you know, know obviously everything about that apartment, the area that you're in, and you know what you're paying. So if you, I think I'm, I'm in the same um, uh, side as Terry in terms of if you can comfortably afford to hold it still, um, and it's in a good area, it ticks a lot of boxes. Then yeah, you don't want to sell it and then and then miss out on all the growth that that may be just around the corner. So uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, let me just scroll up a bit. So I've got a few people here who can't see the slides. Apologies, guys. Um, hopefully you're able to rewatch those bits in the recording. Um, what was the websites you looked at um, in terms of infrastructure going ahead? Uh, so Tom, I just you just can Google it. So um, Victoria was I think it was the big pro. Um, Big projects or, or uh, something similar to that. You just type in infrastructure in the state, um, and uh, you'll be able to find those. They usually come up as a, the first um, first result in, in Google. Um, otherwise, if you're a member of Real Estate Investor, we actually provide all those links next to the uh, the actual listing for that suburb. So you can just click on it, and it will take you to the straight to the, the sites. Um, Tom just asked, do we use Cordell Connect? Uh, so Investor doesn't. Um, Terry, do you use Cordell Connect with any of your research? Uh, not really. Um, we are aware of it. Um, but, you know, Cordell's has been around um, real estate research for as long as I have, um, and I think it you know continues to be a good source of that sort of information. But uh, mm. we tend, um, rather than having one direct source for that kind of thing, we're, we're tapping into a range of sources, including you know local newspapers around the country online uh, looking for announcements um, and we file them electronically we have our own, own system of sort of collecting that kind of data so we're, we're getting our alerts in other ways and putting it in neat little packages um, and so that when we're ready to do a report in a particular area it's all there in, in one of our electronic folders. All right excellent. Um, so Farouz just added a little bit more um, Terry so this is in, in follow up to the uh, Brisbane apartment um, question he had earlier. So he's got a $370,000 mortgage, but realestate.com values it at $250,000. And uh, right. his five-year five interest-only loan is up. So probably the first thing I could probably say is don't rely on the realestate.com valuation. Um, no. um, that's just a desktop valuation and uh, they're not they're not, yeah, they're not accurate. You, you really want to jump on and you know to a site like RP Data or Price Finder or something where you can actually pick comparables, actually look at like for like yourself, and then compare like for like, because yeah. that yeah, that realestate.com value could be based on 
old units that just sold recently, you know, that's comparable to yours. Yeah, I mean, th those sorts of, I mean, we see some of the banks um, advertising constantly on television that, that their, their app can tell you the value of any property, um, but in actual fact, what they give you is a very broad range, which is not very helpful at all. Um, I think it, people should be willing to, to spend a little bit of money on, on a, an independent value and get a proper valuation done if all else fails to get yeah. you know, a true indication of the market value. It sound, does sound very, very low for an inner city apartment in Brisbane and it's unlikely to be accurate. So the first thing to do in, um, in that person's situation is to get a real, um, you know, a proper valuation done so we have a, a true indication of what it's worth um, before making any other decisions, I think. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah, definitely get an independent valuer, and, and uh, if you are seriously considering selling, just to actually find out what you know what what it's, what it's really worth, not not based it on a desktop valuation. Mm, yeah, definitely. Uh, all right. So thank you for that uh, question, and thank you for your comments, Terry. Let's just keep going up. Um, Anna's just asked Terry, do you have a top ten uh, New South Wales report? We have. Um, well, we're kind of doing two parts. We have a top five Sydney hotspots report and we have a top five regional New South Wales report. So they're, they're two separate uh, reports. And if you've got both, they actually um, exist as a bundle on the website. So you can get two for the two reports together for less than the price of, of you, you'd pay if you bought them separately. Um, and so that will probably achieve what you're looking for. Our five top picks for Sydney and our top five picks for regional New South Wales. And it's worth um, pointing out that um, regional New South Wales has been a very strong market. While Sydney was going through its correction, you know, its post-boom correction and prices were falling down sort of 10% or more according to some of the uh, the core logic type data, um, there are many locations in regional New South Wales that were, were doing the opposite, which were rising and producing good growth, but they don't get any media. Um, there's this obsession with Sydney and Melbourne and um, regional markets tend not to get any airplay and uh, there's some very good growth market. Regional Victoria has been great. Regional Tasmania has been fantastic for growth in the last couple of years and there are specific places around regional New South Wales which have done and continue to do very well. Fantastic. Thank you, Terry. Um, hope that's helped, Anna. So just jump on the website and yeah, you'll be able to have a look at look at those. Um, so John's just asked, so what effect on values will the planned Gold Coast M2 have on sleepy suburbs like Jacobs Well and Stapleton? So I'm guessing you're probably talking, John, about the uh, the Coomera connector. If, I think you're talking about that. Um, so look, it, again, it depends on um, where it's going to go through. Obviously, the properties that are going to be right next to that proposed M2 is it's probably not going to have an, a, a positive effect on it. It'll probably go go down if anything. But again, it's going to provide better access. It's going to take a lot of uh, the traffic off the M1 uh, for those that are perhaps just just travelling to from Gold Coast to to Coomera or to um, uh, Stapleton or Jacobs Well. Um, but you're going to have to look at all these other different factors as well. So just because a highway is going through there, if there's no other infrastructure or jobs or anything like that, it's probably not going to have too much of an effect in terms of, 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 of a positive effect on, on values of those areas. Dennis, there was some research some years ago which indicated that when it comes to transport infrastructure, there tends to be three phases of growth. Yep. Um, the first sort of impact on property values is when like a new motorway is first announced. And yep. then when they actually start building the thing, there's another burst of growth. And then when it's actually finished and people can touch it and feel it and experience the benefit of it, there's oh, yes. another phase of growth. Now, if you, you buy it the first phase, you, you get the greatest uplift, but you take the greatest risk because, you know, politicians have a tendency to announce projects, particularly in election campaigns, and then they don't happen or they don't happen anytime soon. So probably the optimum time is when they actually start building a piece of infrastructure like a new motorway. And by that point, the actual route is um, set in stone. We know exactly where it's going to go and which areas are going to benefit because right now with some of those proposals, um, like the alternative to the M1 um, between Brisbane and the Gold Coast, the actual final uh, route is, is not yet, I don't think, certain. So it's very hard to be definitive about which areas are going to benefit the most. So 
it probably does pay to wait till they actually start physically yeah. building a thing. Then, then you can take action because I think most people um, wait until it's finished and they can actually touch it and feel it. Mm. And um, so those who benefit the most probably with the least risk will be the ones who, who buy when they start construction. Great. Thank you, John, for that question. Um, Stevens just asked, how would you rate SQM research as a source of reliable data? Look, I like it a lot, um, and we do use it a lot. Um, that's the uh, SQM research. That's the business of Louis Christopher, who's, um, who's been around real estate research uh, probably even longer than I have, and he's a very respected figure. He does good work. Um, I think he's he's a very credible commentator. I like what he does, and you can get really good information from that website. You know, vacancy rates, for example, it's freely available, um, and it's reliable information. So it's a useful one to know about. Um, it doesn't give you everything you need, but it's, um, as, as part of a, a stable of places that we go to regularly for uh, information we feel we can trust, um, we rate it very highly. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I personally use uh, SQM for vacancy rates as well as um, uh, obviously Investor has, we, we calculated as well and it's pretty much on par. So um, yeah, I don't use it for anything else but, but vacancy rates and they, they, the, the free information is quite powerful because it does, I think it goes back 10, 15 years, um, I think, a fair bit anyway, a number of years so you can actually see, see the trends. I've got um, one of their vacancy rate uh, graphs on the screen because one of the postcodes you mentioned early in the yeah. presentation, I put it up, and um, it goes back to 2005, so it's almost 15 years, so you can very yeah. much see trends as well as telling where vacancy rates currently are. And sometimes I test it out because um, they've got vacancy rate charts for every postcode in the country, and I wonder how the hell do they do that. Um, so I, I sometimes ask people at the coalface, does, according to SQM research, your vacancy rate is X, does that make sense to you? And, and usually the answer is, yeah, that, that sounds about right from what we're experiencing at the mm. coalface of the market. So I do, do tend to find them uh, useful and reliable. Yeah. All right, excellent. Well, it looks like that's come to the end of the questions. So thank you, everyone, who's, who's stuck around. I hope that's been informative. Um, and uh, Terry, I really do appreciate you uh, joining um, us on this webinar. I'm sure a lot of our, our members um, definitely have uh, benefited from, from your insights. So, so thank you again, Terry, for, for your time. Uh, you're welcome, Dennis. It's been fun to be part of. Um, I like what uh, Real Estate Investor does. I think you, at the beginning you, you said it was important for real estate investors to be data driven and you made the, the comment that there's lots of free data available. And I think people need to be very, very careful about, um, you know, the, the, there's so much free stuff out there, but quite often it's free because it's not worth very much. And mostly what we're getting from media, the free stuff is telling us, um, you know, what's happened to medium prices in the last 12 months, which tells us where we should have bought maybe a year or two ago. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I think really good data is worth paying a little bit for, and I think it's false economy to, to not be willing to spend uh, a relatively small sum of money, given that what you're ultimately planning to do is spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a piece of real estate, and if you're not willing to spend a few hundred or a few thousand dollars on good quality data to make sure you make good choices, then it's very much false economy, and far too many people make that mistake, I think, and end up with a bad choice of real estate. Yeah, and I think that's probably why a lot of people are stuck on that one investment property because the value has gone down and they can't take any equity out, they can't move and they can't buy the, yeah. their second property. So it can really halt your your, uh, your your building your assets for, for the future. So really, really important, guys, to uh, yeah, always do your due diligence um, and uh, try and uh, you know take any emotion out of that uh, that decision process. So... Thank you again, everyone. Um, the webinar will be emailed out tomorrow, but if you have any questions at all or you'd like to take up uh, our offer, so um, the Real Estate Investor offer there, um, forward slash special offer, so that'll be available until uh, Sunday night this week. But um, the uh, Hot Spotting Reports Best uh, Buyers Bundle will be available until about Christmas. So uh, thank you again, everyone. I hope uh, you enjoy the uh, rest of your night. Um, if we don't uh, see you on a webinar, um, uh, before Christmas. I hope you have a great break and good, 
uh, happy new year, very safe one, and I uh, wish you all the very best uh, with your property investing for 2020. All right, thanks, Terry. Catch you later. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone who's listened in. Thank you.